A very warm welcome to our Earth Journalism Network webinar on fishery subsidies. My name is Mona Samari. I'm based in Tunis and the co-founder of the West Africa Fisheries Journalism Project, and I'll be the moderator for this panel. I'm joined today by Dr. Rashid Sumela, who's based in Vancouver, Beatrice Gores in Brussels, Alice Tipping in London, and Wanjohi Kabukuru in Nairobi. And of course, all of you, many of whom are journalists and media workers from across the African continent. So a very warm welcome to all of you. Our aim for this webinar is to attempt to untangle some of the key components of the WTO negotiations on fishery subsidies within the global context of overfishing. As more and more important meetings are happening remotely, behind closed doors, and not always with the participation of civil society stakeholders, let alone journalists, webinars like this are vital to assure the free flow of information. It is vital, therefore, as journalists to continue towards the transparency of fisheries negotiations by following these WTO negotiations. Today, our panel will be discussing negotiations which started some 20 years ago and which were set to resume tomorrow, but which have now again been delayed until September. With so many international agreements in place, will this WTO one really make a difference to the lives of African coastal communities who have relied on fishing for generations? Or would it just add more loopholes that will, will allow for big fishing nations like China, South Korea and the EU to continue their thinly veiled overcapacity and overfishing agenda in waters which are not monitored to the level required? I will now pass the floor to a guest who needs very little introduction, but I'll do so anyway. Dr. Rashid Sumela, Professor and Canada Research Chair at the University of British Columbia, widely cited, multiple awards, the recent one being the 2020 Distinguished International Professor by the National University of Malaysia. Very happy to have you on board. Over to you, Dr. Rashid. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for starting this very important network. Because as a scientist, uh, I really don't believe that publishing our papers and putting them in the shelf is enough. We need to get the information out. And how do you do that? You do it with journalists in collaboration with journalists. So, so thank you for doing that. And thank you all for coming. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to get to talk with so many African journalists uh, on this important topic, which actually I'm very passionate about because of what I believe what I see in the data as the negative effects of subsidies to Africa and Africans. So, so thank you. That's the, the title of my talk, why Africa should help make this the end of the line for harmful fishery subsidies. Uh, I strongly believe this. So let's see how we go. In the first place, uh, the reason why Africa, and, and when I say Africa, I'm focusing on this because that's our, our main area of focus today, but it applies to all parts of, 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 the, of the world, of the fishing world, if you like it. Yeah, this is because people, we people, we depend on nature, no matter how you look at it. I mean, when there's no fish, there will be no fishes or fishermen, as some would like to say, there will be no fish dollars, there will be no fish, uh, there's the, no, no fish shillings or naira or, or, or CD, right? That is the beginning. So the environment is quite central. And if you boil it down to the basics, there are two things we people do with nature. We go in and take the good things, the fish, you know, the oil, the gas we take from nature, take it into our human system, do what we do with it, and we produce waste and it goes back to the environment. So from the environment, good things come to the environment, bad things go. And we need to do these two things wisely, otherwise we destroy the source of life indeed, which is our marine environment and the environment in general. And how are we doing? I mean, when you look at this, actually all the evidence, the data shows that we are overtaking the resources we need from the ocean, from our rivers, from our lakes, from our environment, and we are also over polluting them. I don't need to belabor in, on this. Uh, no one who has been to the coast or uh, areas around the coast will know that this is real. We're taking the big fish, we're, we are destroying the habitat, we are overtaking. Climate change is uh, accelerating with ocean acidification and deoxygenation. 
pollution, plastic pollution into the ocean. It's all over the place. Oil spills in West Africa, for example. The, the world doesn't talk about it. Uh, I understand there's more oil spill in that region than what we see in the US. Meanwhile, when there's one in the US, the whole world hears it. There is a lot going on. And if you look at the data, this, this, is, uh, this, is, this is not a drawing. This is based on scientific work. If you look at North, Northwest Africa, the biomass of fish just a few decades ago was quite high here. And now these are what scientists are estimating this is where we are. And as we are doing that, naturally, we, we, we cut a lot and now we are stabilized or even declining. And whilst this is happening, we are actually fishing harder. We are going further. We are going deeper. And one of the main reasons we're able to do that is because of subsidies, as I will come back. Because this shows that the economics is not good. You are going there with boats and people and machines and you are coming back with less fish. That doesn't work economically. It works in most instances because of subsidies, uh, what we call harmful subsidies. And that picture you see, if you go into the ocean, as we try to do scientists with all our tools, this is the picture you get. So in the 1960s, the more reddish it is, the more fish it is, there is in the coast. And now look at what we have here, right? So, so that gives you, and this is not a painting, this is really an estimate of the biomass of fish there. So, and, and I don't need to talk to you when I, I was in, in Cape Coast, two, two weeks ago I was in Cape Coast and actually we went to the coast as part of our field work. They don't catch no fish, you go out, they can't get, meanwhile sea level rises, eating up their home. So this is as real as you can, you can think of it. So less fish and healthy environment and healthy ocean directly impacts people. So this somebody says, is that all the shrimp I get? And, and this lady is an example of more environmental uh, refugees that we see. If you are in your coastal community, there's no fish, sea level rise. People don't just sit down and die. Human beings have brains, we move. If it's too hard, we move. So we're getting more and more refugees. And I don't need to talk a lot about this, Europeans and West Africans, we know the dynamics here, so. Now, all of these things, when, when you come in as an economist, you are thinking, how do we deal with this? And economists will say, remove the incentive to overfish. And there are many ways you can do this. That's why we have national fisheries management. We have regional management in, in Africa. We need a lot of this. The Gulf of Guinea, about 16 countries fish there and they behave as if they are the only ones in the ecosystem. No, you have to think, you have to think collectively in order to manage this and drive away all the illegal fishes and so on who come in just because our, our countries are not big and they don't have the resources. But if we work together and chip in, we can chase out illegal fishing. Buy insurance, create marine reserves. This is really an economic tool, not only a biological tool. That's why you don't put all your savings in, in one stock, even if it's flying today because you don't know tomorrow. So carve out part of your ocean and protect it. So when you make mistakes, the, the, the other is there to, to back you up. Remove and please remove, 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 redirect harmful subsidies. And harmful subsidies are simply subsidies that, that encourage and incentivize the fishing sector to fish more, to fish harder, to go further, to go deeper. So, so which they wouldn't be able to do without the extra money that comes from subsidies, you get it? So if you give your, your fisheries fuel subsidies, what it does is it's, it just makes them fish more than they would under the market system. And that's why we call them harmful subsidies. And that's the topic for the rest of, of our time here. So this is a simple model uh, that I published with my PhD student uh, last year, I think. It, it's just saying that, look, we need to find a way to live in harmony with nature. Otherwise we are toast. It's just a question of time, right? And the way we do this is how we put our policies and the actions we take. We do them such that we encourage positive feedback from people to nature, to the marine environment in this case, and from the marine environment to people. How do you do this? Let's take subsidies as an example. If government wants to support the fishing community, there are many ways you can do it. You can give them fuel subsidies, which means you're making them fish more and harder than they would. Or you can use that same money to actually train people, help people. In, in Mexico, I visited a small fishing community. When their students come home on holidays, 
The government hires the students so they can go collect data with the fisheries department. You see, rather than giving fuel subsidies, they keep the money in the community. They also train the students so they have more skills, so they don't hang on the last fish. You know, this is the kind of thinking we need to do. In Germany, they're talking about paying people to fish for plastic rather than fish because the fish is under pressure. People get their livelihoods, they get their incomes. The fish gets a break, the ocean is clean up, win, win, win all over. And in the future, we have more fish for everybody. So that is the kind of thinking we need rather than just give them subsidies that destroy the environment. What are fishery subsidies? Essentially, is your tax money that government passed on to a given sector, in this case, fisheries, for all sorts of reasons, sometimes political. You want more votes? There's voting coming in six months. Here is your subsidies. That does not help the fish and therefore will not help the community, right? And except if you are just thinking only today. So that is fishery subsidies for you. Why should Africa be at the forefront of this in my view? Number one, a big amount of money goes into this globally, $35 billion. And in economics, we talk about opportunity cost. These $35 billion, if you put them into subsidies, you cannot put them into hospitals, into schools. And for me, this is what really, really kills me when I think of Africa. You know, do you want to, all the girls to go to school or do you want to give this, the, the $1 million you have so people will buy fuel cheaply and go and destroy the resource they, they depend on? So for me, this is the thing. I wish I could get every African minister and say, tell me, you, madam, are you, is this what you want to use your scarce resources for? Huh? Uh, with all the other needs in the community, trade impacts. Developing countries really suffer in this from all our data because we don't have the money to give as much as, as when I say developing country in fisheries, for example, I don't see China as a developing fishery country. It has lots of resources. So, so you don't have the resources as China if you are Togo or, or if you are Kenya, right, to do the same. So that's something to remember. This contributes over fishing and leads to all sorts of things, sabotages the sustainable development goals. And I'll quickly just give you some headlines on that. But before I do that, this is our latest uh, uh, estimate of subsidies. Usually subsidies is like everything. It's not always, it's not all bad. And in economics, we know that you can give taxpayer money to do the society's work, help improve the system, help improve people. That is a good thing. We call them beneficial subsidies. Then you have the capacity enhancing so-called harmful or overfishing subsidies that really encourage overfishing. Fuel is one, or you buy engines for people, or you, you pay fishers to get on board and go and fish. You can pay them to go on holiday. I wouldn't mind. I mean, I like more money in the communities. Don't get me wrong, but let those monies work for nature and people and people and nature rather than undermine. So that's the point we're making. And if you look here, you see China, we're talking about almost 6 billion and look at the whole continent of Africa, 1.4 billion. And then you look at the good, the good, the, 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 the bad subsidies about 1 billion. So imagine we can take this 1 billion and really do good stuff, whether it's manage the fisheries well, put in MPAs or educate the community, give them more livelihood opportunities rather than fish the, take the fish down. But, but, but this is still small compared to, to China, for example, or to the EU, the, the, Euro, the European Union. So that is why the trade dynamics comes. African fishers actually are disadvantaged in the market. And small scale fishers, oh my God, this picture when we did it blew my mind, right? The 35 billion, if you look at it, only 16% in this estimate, which was an earlier estimate, goes to small scale fishers. 84% goes to the large industry. That's why big Chinese or European boats can, boats can steam to West Africa or any part of the world and take the fish. So that's it. And most of the subsidies they get are actually bad subsidies, 60%. And the small scale is 40%. So if we take out all the bad subsidies, actually, we change the dynamics for small scale fishing, for the developing country fishery, even if we don't do anything else, you know. So that this is very important. Okay, disadvantages small scale fishes, disadvantages this, the developing countries, African countries, disadvantages women, and this is very important, gender. I really think that 
the one single thing Africa can do to improve our situation is send all girls to school, African girls. Give them the same opportunities as the board, or even more, because they are starting at a disadvantage, right? So, and, and the fishery subsidies go to this large industrial. More, most women who fish are actually fishing with small scale in the small scale sector. So by doing that, you are disadvantaging some women, you are advantaging the youth and so on and so forth. Please, let's do something about this. This is the time to do this. You take out more fish, this is overfishing in Africa, one, one million tons of fish a year, which is lost because of overfishing subsidies, a big part of that. That's a lot of food, jobs and so on. So let's take that out. And I talked about disadvantaging uh, 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 developing countries for every dollar, a fisher gets in Africa, somebody in Canada or Europe or China gets $7. So that is a disadvantage. We got to take this thing, level the fishing ground for people all over the world, for all genders and for the youth also, right? So at the end of it, my, my last slide, for the continent, I really think what the continent needs to do is to seize the moral high ground. You just go to the WT and say, imagine African countries say, look, we know harmful subsidies are bad for us, for everybody. We know that a lot of the rich country subsidies end up in our waters. That's one of our latest uh, study where we showed that foreign subsidies impacting African waters is two times the subsidies Africans themselves give their, their fishing industry. So imagine that. So the burden of all the subsidies from China, the European Union, from the big countries, actually ends up in, in developing countries. So we see the moral high ground. We will take our, our subsidies, do something with it, if the world does it, and we, we kind of stage the, 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 take the claim there. And I think that would really make Africa look good in so many ways. Young people in Canada will be celebrating Africa because we help the world to achieve something that will ensure that they too can have get healthy, nutritious fish to eat. Uh, there is a need to be innovative with public funds. If you are going to spend a dollar and you are in Ghana, in Togo, in, uh, in Namibia, in, in Tunisia, please think about the consequences of that. How will it best help the people you are elected or voted in to serve? Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Sumela. It's a great honor to have you here. And I hope that our participants will be able to compile some questions for you, seeing that we have the opportunity to have you online. Um, there is actually a chat option with this webinar in which the participants are more than welcome to post some of their questions. Please keep in mind that no question is stupid in fisheries. Effectively, the simpler the question, the better the question. So don't be afraid to ask a very simple question. Our panel is here to answer that. We know that there's a lot of technical jargon. So in the face of the scale of the issues faced uh, as presented by Dr. Sumela in his presentation, should least developed countries been given exemptions in the negotiations? Our next speaker is Alice Tipping, who is the leading expert at the Sustainable Trade and Fisheries Sub Subsidies Department of the International Institute for Sustainable Development, who will be discussing some of these thorny issues. The floor is yours, Alice. Thank you very much indeed uh, for the invitation to be here. And thank you to you all for joining. It's wonderful to see such a, a wide group of African journalists interested in this very important issue. Um, so perhaps I'll recap uh, just briefly what the, the very basic rules are that we're talking about um, in the World Trade Organization. Uh, and then I'll talk about what some of the ideas for exemptions are and, and why those ideas are there. So uh, I guess that the way to think about it is that there are basically three main pillars, three main rules that are on the table in the WTO. The first is that the is the idea that there shouldn't be any subsidies provided to vessels that have been caught engaged in illegal or unreported or unregulated fishing, right? So no subsidies for vessels caught by a coastal state or by a flag state engaged in doing this. Uh, and that should be a no brainer, really. The second idea is that we should, governments should agree not to provide subsidies for fishing 
of stocks that are already overfished. So for whom a large part of the, the fishery has already been caught, right? Um, so in this second uh, idea, the second main rule, there would already be an exemption for all members. They could continue to provide subsidies, but only subsidies that help to restore the fish stock to a healthy state. So that would be, in, at least in the text as it is, that's an exemption already built in that would apply to all members. The, there's a, a sort of, in the, in the third pillar, there's probably two things to focus on. The first is the idea that there would be no subsidies allowed for distant water fishing, right? So no subsidies uh, that push, that are really designed to push vessels out into another EEZ or out into the high seas. Um, and that seems to be an idea that has quite wide support. Uh, uh, although there are some fishing nations, as you can imagine, that are a bit uncomfortable with the idea. So in that third pillar, the first idea is no subsidies for distant water fishing. The second idea, which I'll focus on because uh, it's a big part of the agreement, is that there would be a main prohibition that would essentially have governments agree not to provide any subsidies that carry a big risk of leading to overfishing. So the harmful subsidies that Rashid was talking about, like subsidies to build new vessels, like subsidies for fuel for fishing vessels, the kinds of subsidies that make it a lot cheaper to fish and therefore tend to encourage more fishing than would otherwise be economic and more fishing than is often sustainable given the resource. So this is what I call kind of the main prohibition sitting at the end of the text. And there are two kinds of exceptions in the text for, for that particular prohibition. And the first would be available to all WTO members. So all governments could continue to provide these harmful subsidies if they can show they have measures to keep stocks healthy or at least that are designed to keep stocks healthy. So that exemption would apply to everyone. The second kinds of exemptions are the ones Mona was talking about, exemptions for developing country members. And there are several different options here. The first is that all least developed countries, many of whom are in Africa, least developed countries would be exempt from this main prohibition. So they could continue to provide all of the subsidies to fuel to vessel construction if they wished. In addition to that, other developed countries, not least developed, but developing countries could continue to provide these harmful subsidies to their small scale fishing close to shore, right? And many, this, is, this exemption is there and currently it's being, uh, Currently, the negotiations are focusing on whether this exemption uh, should be time limited, whether it should apply for a number of years, or whether it should, in fact, be permanent. And the latest text suggests that this exemption could be permanent. And this, I think, responds to lots of governments who have said, we have few other options for some of our small scale fishing communities other than to pay for their fuel, other than to buy them new vessels or buy them new nets to continue fishing. Now, I suspect Rashid will have uh, other views, but I think one of the challenges here is how can we ensure that there is flexibility for this particular sector for small scale fishing, but also somehow take the opportunity to move to more sustainable forms of support, right? To redirect support, as Rashid was saying, uh, away from subsidies that tend to encourage too much fishing effort to subsidies that are really more effective at supporting fishers' livelihoods. But there is that clear idea there. And in fact, ministers are talking tomorrow uh, about precisely this exemption um, and its importance. So in addition to that, there's another idea as well, which is that developing countries could also provide some of these harmful subsidies to larger scale fishing, maybe just for a particular period of time. And once that time period had expired, then they would have to show, like everyone else, that they had sustainability measures in place if they wanted to provide these subsidies. And again, I think the, the, the background of this idea is that many developing countries argue that they want to build fleets to fish their own resources and they want to build these fleets with subsidies. 
and they argue they may not have sustainability measures in place when they build these fleets. And I suspect Rashid may have something to say about this idea as well. Uh, but just very briefly then, a kind of a recap, what are we talking about? Uh, in Geneva at the World Trade Organization, the prohibition on subsidies to fishers caught engaged in illegal fishing, the prohibition on subsidies, unless they're really good subsidies, the prohibition of subsidies to stocks that are already overfished. And then this, sorry, and then the third one, this idea of subsidies, no subsidies to distant water fishing. And then in this main prohibition, uh, a prohibition or a rules saying you cannot provide particular harmful kinds of subsidies unless you have sustainability, fisheries management measures in place, or some specific additional exemptions like for small scale fishing for developing countries. So I know there's a lot of information there, but just to give you a sense of what we're actually talking about in the WTO, and I'd be happy to answer questions afterwards. And thanks again, Mona, for the invitation. My pleasure, Alice. Thank you very much for that presentation and for that overview. Of course, all the participants are welcome to interview Alice separately if you'd like to find out more information about any of the points that were raised. Now, if we can work on the principle that there are too many boats catching too little fish, then we can already start to understand what the impacts are of subsidizing a sector which does not put sustainability at the core of its business model. Big fishing nations, including the EU, have come under increased scrutiny over the coming years, over the past years, sorry. We are very lucky today to be joined by Beatrice Gores, who is leading the fight in EU equitable agreements rooted in good practice in Africa. Beatrice is the coordinator and spokesperson of the Coalition for Fair Fisheries Arrangements and will be providing an EU perspective from an Africa small scale funnel, which is quite unique. The floor is yours, Beatrice. Thank you very much, Mona. And uh, yes, to, to come back to what you said, I think there are too many industrial vessels catching too few fish. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really a, a question of having less industrial vessels like EU vessels. Uh, in fact, I was discussing yesterday about this meeting. Once I knew that I was on the panel, uh, I discussed it with our African partners and they asked me to tell also the, the participants that uh, what, in their view, what is coming out of the discussion seems very good, but as often the devil is in the details. And it will be very important to understand how these exemptions to the discipline will be applied, will be understood, understood by, by the countries. And two examples I would like to give on that. First is on IUU fishing. So as uh, Alice was explaining, the proposal is to stop subsidizing IUU fishing. And then the fishers told me, yes, are you fishing illegal? We agree with that. Uh, we see these trawlers coming into our, our fishing zones. We would like these guys not to be subsidized anymore and not to come anymore in our, in our fishing zone. But are you fishing is also underreported and unregulated. And there's a lot of underreporting and unregulated fishing in artisanal fisheries which is not the desire of artisanal fishers, but is just often the governments do not find it uh, interesting to, to, to put enough uh, means to collect the data about artisanal fishers, for example, about their catches. So often their catches are underreported, which means also that they are underestimated as a, as a kind of sector. So if the, this kind of underreporting is sanctioned, then it's not very conducive to sustainable artisanal fisheries. So they said, be careful when you say, are you you? We agree with the illegal fishing, which has to be combated even in artisanal fisheries, but there is the you you, and we would like to understand how these will be uh, uh, considered in the negotiations. Another example is about the fuel subsidies. Uh, like Mr. Sumaila was saying, fuel subsidies, I think, is bad. Whether it's for industrial fisheries or artisanal fisheries, the effect of uh, fuel subsidy is bad. But in many countries, the only uh, subsidies that is available now to fishers is fuel subsidy or fuel detaxation. Uh, there is very little investment by, by African countries into their artisanal fisheries. When you see the working conditions of fishers, the working conditions of women, fish processors, it's really, it's, it's really bad. No, it's really horrible kind of conditions. The women are, are, are processing fish in the smoke for day, uh, day, day, days and days. Uh, the, the fishers have no, uh, no possibility to have uh, kind of safe landing uh, conditions. Uh, Sanitation is missing on the beaches. So you have all of these uh, problems in the artisanal fishing, which are not being really addressed by the government. So there is not enough investment in artisanal fisheries. So 
they say, yes, okay, we understand that fuel subsidies are bad, but at the moment, that's the only way we can have our activity. That's the only way we can contribute to food security is because we are using the tax fuel. So we would like to have other kinds of subsidies, other kinds of investment in our communities for better infrastructure, for access to uh, potable water, for access to electricity, so that we can have uh, better or, or do our activities in a more efficient way. But we don't have that for the moment. So we have to redirect subsidies. And I think a, a very good opportunity for doing that is next year. 2022 will be the international year of artisanal fisheries and aquaculture. So this is really a very important moment to raise awareness with government in Africa and elsewhere to say, okay, you are subsidizing uh, fisheries. You have, if you want to, to have sustainable fisheries, you have to redirect these subsidies towards sustainable small scale fisheries. And now is the time to do it because now is the year where everyone will have their eyes on what you are doing about artisanal fisheries. And also, you have a guide to do that. You're not going into the uh, unknown. There is a guide which is called the FAO Voluntary Guideline for Sustainable Small-Scale Fisheries, which is really a kind of guide with about 10 chapters, which tells you what is good to do for women fish processors. What is good to do if you want to improve the uh, uh, processing techniques? What is good to do if you want to improve the fishing techniques to have sustainable artisanal fisheries? So you have that guide, you have the money, so please do the needful. And that's really the strong message that the artisanal fishing communities have to their government, to the international community, do the needful, take the opportunity of this international year of artisanal fisheries and, and use the money efficiently to support sustainable fishing communities. So when you come to, to fuel subsidies, the other side of it, and then I come back to the EU, are the big countries, the big developed countries, which says we want to continue benefiting for these fuel subsidies. In the case of the EU, they say, we don't want to have a removal of our detaxed fuel. So the, the fuel used by the fisheries is a fuel which is detaxed. It's true that it's, it's a bad thing and they shouldn't be able to benefit from this detaxed fuel. But then when it comes to distant water fisheries, the thing is that they can easily go through, through other sources of fuel, which will be very little taxed. So, for example, if you have um, a, a big vessel, a big tuna vessel in the Indian Ocean, it can easily get very cheap fuel. It doesn't need to have the EU detaxed fuel. Same thing in West Africa. You have ports where these vessels are going refueling. They're not paying tax on the local fuel. So it's not really something that will have a very big impact on the activities of the distant water, EU distant water fishing. Inside the EU, yes, because if you don't have the detax fuel inside the EU, that will have an impact on the, the activities that are, that are carried on there. But on distant water fisheries uh, for the EU, it's really easy for them to access cheap fuel. So that thing is not going to uh, affect very much their activities. What is going to affect their activities for me are two things. Are, one is the access agreements. And as Alice was saying, the idea is to stop subsidizing the access of EU fleets or, and other fleets through access agreement. This is something really good, something we fully support. We have always asked to the EU and to the EU boat owners, pay the 100% of your access cost. First of all, it's fair on the EU taxpayer. I don't see why we have to pay uh, for the, the EU vessels to get access to Senegalese waters, Mauritanian waters, Seychelles waters. Secondly, I think that if the EU vessels have to pay 100% of their access cost, it will really show that at least some segments of the EU fleet, like for example, the coastal trawlers that are fishing in West Africa, they are not sustainable. They are not environmentally sustainable. We know that because they are fishing unselectively. They are fishing often very close to the shore, but they are not even economically sustainable. So I think by removing the, the, the subsidies, it will really show that some of the segments of the EU uh, vessels shouldn't be operating because they are not sustainable from any kind of point of view. So this is really an important aspect of it to ensure that the access agreement are not a vehicle for subsidizing access cost of the operators. But then if you look at access agreement in the case of the EU, but certainly in the case of other distant water fleets, uh, it's only the tip of the iceberg. Government to government agreements is only one way by which or through which uh, foreign vessels get access to African waters. Another way is, for example, reflagging. We have a lot of vessels which are from China, a little bit from EU like Spain or, or, or Greece, who 
are going to, to access African waters by reflagging, by taking, for example, the local flag. And we see that in these cases, in most of these cases, what happens is that these vessels are really um, taking advantage of the, uh, the, 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 the feeble uh, capacities of the coastal state to police its waters. So th this reflagging issue is really important and stopping or, or yeah, stopping the, the subsidizing of reflagging operation is really very, very important to protect our fishing communities in Africa. So no subsidies for access agreement to subsidize access costs and no subsidies, certainly no subsidies for reflagging. Another important aspect of the, uh, of the, the text which is, which is proposed is the, the issue of notification, so the transparency of fishery subsidies. We think it's really important because at the moment we have hardly any information about the, the who receives subsidies. Well, we have some, some figures, some uh, big figures, but when you come to the nitty gritty, we don't know which operators have received which subsidies to do what. And this is really important to have more information about, about that. Um, when we look at transparency, and we look at subsidy in general, and this is my last uh, point, one thing I still regret, I always regret, it's not on the table for discussion, but is the absence of aquaculture. So aquaculture is not covered by the discipline. And what we see now is that aquaculture is taking very big importance in the world in terms of providing uh, uh, fish for the consumers, but it's also fueling uh, depletion of fish resources, for example, in West Africa. The West Africa fish, the West Africa small pelagics, feeds salmon in Norway, feeds salmon in Chile, feeds other fish and salmon in China. So, and, and then this salmon, of course, comes on, on rich markets like the EU market. So this is really more important now than it was 20 years ago. So maybe that's a reason why it wasn't really uh, addressed 20 years ago when the negotiation started. But really, the issue of aquaculture and how much subsidies goes to aquaculture and how much of these subsidies are harmful, including for fish meat production and fish oil production, is really something that, probably not now, but in the future is something that uh, should be on the table as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Beatrice. Um, so we've had our expert panel provide insight into the WTO negotiations, but as journalists, how do we convert this into a story which not only covers the WTO negotiation process, but actually engages your readers or your viewers in a story that goes beyond people getting together in a room and discussing um, negotiations? So we all know that within our sector, covering fisheries and ocean related issues have come with a lot of problems. One problem is trying to convince the editor to run with a fishery story or an ocean story. And one way around that is to kind of locate the human angle in within the fishery story and also try and get the voices from the fishing communities which are impacted by some of these decisions. We're very lucky to have today with us Wanjohi Kabukuru who will be discussing exactly how he has been working as a journalist to cover the WTO negotiations and also other ocean stories. Over to you Wanjohi. Thank you so much, uh, Mona, for giving me this platform to share with my colleagues the experiences uh, that I've gone through. We are grateful also for having all participants joining to uh, understand and go deeper into this issue. Actually, the story of uh, fisheries, uh, subsidies, the whole business that is fish is a very interesting topic, only that it is told badly and boring. And that's the biggest challenge that journalists have. How do we make the fishery story interesting? Fish is interesting. Fisheries itself as a subject is one of the best things that you'll ever come across. So why is it that we are losing the entire narrative about fisheries, about subsidies. Basically, when we don't get it right on fisheries, then you lose the entire chain about subsidies. How are these negotiations? What does it mean? And pick any major story about fisheries in the last couple of weeks, and there are three things that you will note about them. One, they speak about fish in a generalized fashion. 
But fish is a major topic that can be unpacked in so many ways and in beautiful, interesting aspects. Reason being one, you don't have one species of fish. There are thousands of them. So you may start by talking about tuna fish. You may start talking about mackerel and tilapia and so on. That is in itself has already given you the first paragraph to your story. The second aspect that makes, goes to make your story interesting is after you've identified a particular species. Then you get fishermen who know about a particular type species of fish. After that, you move on to a scientist, a marine scientist who definitely uh, will tell you something about the inland fisheries and the coastal fisheries. Normally, there is no distinction. And uh, when we are writing or getting our documentaries about uh, fisheries, we are normally just discussing the generalized version. Not that it's supposed to be that way, but it's because some much of the time is that the interesting aspects are missed out when we don't dwell deeper into the subject. But it needs to take time. It needs interest. And how do you create this interest? First, understand your subjects. Then add color to your stories in the sense that when you are interviewing fishermen, ask them their really daily life and their struggles. They will tell you everything. But the problem is that some, most of the time, we don't translate what the fishermen tell us and then compare it with what the scientists say. And then most importantly, bring in the policy aspects. What is the government's policy that we have? For instance, we are talking about uh, fish subsidies. Most uh, journalists will not even engage in it because one, they don't follow the procedures that are involved. Reason being, it's a whole ecosystem when you're discussing fisheries. One, when to, if you want to get information on fisheries, one, the fish stock aspect, it comes in. Mostly you, for you to get the content on the fisheries stock, you will get it from the fisheries research organizations, the fisheries regional fisheries management organizations, or if you want to the global scale, you go to the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. For the UN now, that is the trade aspect. That is for the WTO, that is the trade aspect, how people are trading and all of it. But you see here, what we are having, that link between WTO and FAO brings in the aspect of, one, you've understood the trade aspects, and two, you've understood the stock aspect, the conservation aspect, and also either there's overfishing and that kind of thing, and who controls fishing. That is where you go to the FAO. If you want the trade aspect, you go to the WTO. Already you are now getting a more interesting aspect of your story because you have not, not only have two sources of information, but you have the money aspect too. The story of fish is not just about nutrition. It's also about economics. It's also about finance and the fisheries aspect comes in. Then we go to the conservation aspect. When you move into the conservation aspect, where do you get information on conservation aspect? There are two ways. You can go through the community ways, which is a must, actually. No story should ever miss out the aspect of communities, the aspect about people. That is the cornerstone of good stories. So for you to impress the editors, that's the cornerstone. Once you get that as a benchmark, then that's when you move in. How do you now? color your story. And to color your story doesn't mean that you talk in colorful words. It means you get more information that will make sense to everyone across the chain, from the fisherman, to the scientist, to the policymakers, and of course, now to the general, you tie in general aspect and the international aspect. Fisheries is not a national issue only, it's international. That's why you are hearing the discussion by the scientists previously talking about the distant water fishing nation. These are countries that send fishing fleets to other countries. Why does this happen? Because most other countries, they need fish. The demand for fish is high. Now, the challenge for us journalists is how do we make this story interesting? If there is so much demand, if there is so much and the supply is little, it means there is a lot of interest. But how comes then the journalists are missing the aspect of making it interesting? And that's how you tie in 
how you get the information from all these sources to bend your story, to connect the dots and make it interesting. Other aspects that come in is that most people that write about fisheries, they write about inland fisheries. And even when they write about inland fisheries, we lack a major aspect in the inland fisheries. One, and this is lacking in so many other aspects that you'll find on fishery stories, is we do not take the most, the simplest and the easiest thing to do a boat ride that is for inland fisheries. Or we take into the fishing fleets, the past sinners. Rarely will you find a story of a journalist who boarded a past sinner or a long liner to get to the deep sea and then tell the story from the front line. Or one who boarded um, the skiffs and the outrigger boats to go with the fishermen to, to see how they do it and then tell that aspect of the story as you rope in now the scientific aspects. Here is how you design your story. You talk to the marine fisheries uh, researchers, the scientists, they give you everything that you want to know. And the worst aspect that we all have as journalists is we assume that we know everything. That has been our undoing. What has helped me as a journalist, speaking from a personal point of view, is that I've always approached it as I don't know. 100% of the time, that hook has helped me a lot. If you start a story from you don't know you want to know, people will welcome you, not just into their homes, but it also into their worker boards for you to see how they work, for you to see how the nets are laid, how the traps are set. And then the scientists will take you through the process. What do you mean by mature fish? Those are kind of questions that you, then the species, how long do they take to mature? Where are they sold? What happens in a research institute, in a fisheries research institute? Those are the kind of things that are missing in our conversation. And when those things are missing, then the, the other aspect of subsidies will not be touched because the basics are not there. So the other more concrete issues, which is heavy money. Subsidies, we are talking of huge amounts of money. Uh, when you're giving fuel subsidies, countries, uh, really battle about this. And when you're talking about that without understanding the other basics, then that's where we lose the plot. So the basis for us to restart is you rethink the whole concept about telling the fishery stories from scratch. Once you accept that, it doesn't matter how many years you've been in journalism. You can always make a fresh start. And that's why journalism becomes one of the best uh, professions in the sense that we have what we call, you can go on sabbatical studies and that kind of thing. The reason for this is you go and refresh and restart. If you want to become a specialist writer, a specialist documentary film uh, on fisheries, there is a lot to learn. The good thing is that it's the most interesting aspect you'll ever learn. It's very refreshing and it has different experiences every other day. A fisherman on Lake Tanganyika does not have the same experience as a fisherman on Zambezi River, a fisherman on Lake Chad, and a fisherman in the Atlantic Ocean. Those are very different aspects, different ways to tell the stories. They are not the same experiences, but these are the most interesting stories that we are, uh, we are getting slow in capturing, and we need to get fast there to capture these stories. What we just need to remember is that fish is very interesting in as much as it doesn't feature so much in the mainstream media. It can feature if we only get the basics right and know where to get the right information and how to tie the loose ends in our stories to make them more interesting, to unpack the difficulties that are there. And it's the easiest thing to get the journalist, uh, the scientists to speak to you and the fishermen to negotiate with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Wanjohi, for that input. That was very insightful. And I'd like to remind all the journalists participating that there is actually a link. There is an opportunity to apply for a story grant to produce stories, compelling stories like the ones that Wanjohi described as part of the Earth Journalism Network set of grants. So I think that link has been posted in the chat 
and you're more than welcome to apply for that grant. So we don't have much time left and I know that we'll be losing uh, Professor Sumela at the hour. So I would like to start off the questions that are addressed to you, Professor Sumela. So we have a very good one here from Busani Bafana. Professor Sumela, what are we failing to do as Africa in using policies to positive subsidies work for Africa? And I'll also tag on another question for you from Alex McMaster for Rashid. Do you have any examples of alternative livelihoods that have been supported by redirected subsidies? Or if there are not yet any examples, perhaps you have suggestions. Yeah. Um, and actually, I have another one um, from Joseph Mazigi. Uh, foreign fish investors have suffocated the local fishing communities. How should local fishers be helped to remain in business? Mm. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so these are excellent questions, all of them, actually. So uh, the first one is about positive subsidies in Africa. And I think that is something we need to really use all the brains we have to try to design them and define them. Uh, so, so like I said, on, using taxpayer money in the sector is it's not all bad. We can do it well. So we need a lot of thinking in there. And I had that example from Mexico. I find it very interesting where school, high school kids and university students come home and they are employed and they are sent to the fishing ministry to learn statistics and collect data, which is very useful uh, knowledge to use anyway. So, so we need to do that. And then in terms of positive subsidies also, one thing is illegal fishing. There's a lot of it happening in our paper, which we published last year in Science Advances. We identified Asia and Africa. The two continents alone, they, they, they lose 85% of all the economic losses that come out of illegal fishing is in Africa and Asia. So the continent has to do something. And here we can use uh, clever taxpayer money to do this. And the way to do it is to have a col collaboration between the nations. So you chip in a bit, you chip in, set up a system. You can even buy the boats that you need to chase up illegal fishes, make it really hard for people to come into African waters to fish. So there are all these kinds of things. And not to talk about what you can do outside the fishing sector, uh, allowing people to train well, the hospitals and all the things we need in the communities. Now, alternative livelihoods, that's, uh, that's connected to the, 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 the first question, actually. We did a project in uh, Hong Kong years back where, where they asked us to look at and do an analysis of alternative livelihood. And, and so we did an interview. We went into uh, Hong Kong fishing communities and asked them, if you had the right conditions, uh, are you willing to move to another sector or and, and, and actually 75% of the fishers said, oh yes, I mean, under the right conditions they would. So, so that's already a good sign. So, but many of them wanted to still deal with the water. So ecotourism is you go to Hong Kong, you do dolphin watching, you do whale watching, and those things are, are, are actually part of the, the way you, you, you find alternative livelihoods and retrain people and, and so on. Now, the last question is what? The last question is how do we, how do we help African fishers against all the foreign fishing that is coming? You know, one of the things you do, how the WTO to take away harmful subsidies. Uh, like I alluded to, there's a beautiful map which was distributed on, on social media where we had Africa and we showed all the countries where the subsidies that are imported, that are shipped from big countries into African waters where the subsidies are bigger than whatever subsidies Africans give themselves, right? So let's take out the harmful subsidies and I tell you, we begin helping small scale fishers in Africa right away. And then if we redirect the subsidies to support their work, the Beatrice was talking about uh, going more detail what you need to do. And that's the level we go to once we get the agreement, how do you really do this to help people and nature? and not disadvantage small scale fishers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rashid. Um, so we have another question here from Lucia Tieno. Um, she would like to know which particular SDG needs urgent attention in Africa uh, and as they are sabotaged by subsidies. 
Is there anybody in our panel who would like to answer that? Anybody else, right? <laughs> no, oh, Over to you. Could I go? Yes, please. You see, the thing about, about uh, fish is so central to many things that happen in African coastal communities, right? Uh, it's, it's, and when I say Africa, it happens here too in BC, the indigenous people, the coastal community, fish is so central. And fish is not just what they eat, it's the culture, it's everything. So once we deal, we manage our fisheries well, that goes to give us more food. So that is food security. You remember the SDGs, it one or two, no hunger, no hunger, right? So, so our estimate is that we lose about 10 million tons of fish a year due to overfishing. That's about 10 million mature cows, people in terms of protein, right? And, and good protein, better than beef actually, right? So anything we can do to protect our ocean and the life in it will actually impact no poverty, no hunger, uh, inequality. If we do it properly, the subsidy will reduce inequality. And so it's, it's in the middle of many of these SDGs. So let's deal with overfishing, remove the harmful subsidies and we'll get a lot of co-benefits. Thank you very much, Rashid. Um, we have one question here from Kwabena Mohammed Gaddafi. Um, the question is, how serious is the situation in Africa, particularly Ghana in West Africa? So I might actually pass that to you as well, Rashid, seeing that you've just come back from there and, and also invite um, our other panelists to, to provide input if possible. Yeah. So Ghana, Ghana is, uh, the coast of Ghana is, is quite an efficient coast if you go along. And it's not only now, it's historical, you know. The Fanti people of Ghana have been going along the coast since I think 1400 or so in their little boats, they could go very far up and down the, 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 coast, the Atlantic coast, South Atlantic coast. So there's a solid tradition of fishing and a lot of people depend on this. If you go to the coast, I mean, you, you can't believe it. The women are waiting for the fish to come. The women are financing the fish. And, and the, the, the whole life, it depends on that. And you go to Cape Coast where I went to, it's amazing, right? So, so this is, again, one of the reasons that drive me. Uh, and then you go there now, you see, they say, we go out for, for a week. We don't get the fish. We catch six hours, only a few decades ago. And, and the pressure is on. And this leads to many things, lack of education. They can't send their children to school. They can help care. Oh my gosh. So we, we really need to, to, to do something uh, when you think about Ghana and other coastal country, uh, communities around the world. Thank you very much, Rashid. I know that you have to leave our webinar shortly. I'd like to really thank you for your participation. Um, if it's okay for all the other panelists, because we have so many good questions, if we can stay another 10 minutes, um, we, can, we can get through those. But I just wanted to make sure to thank Rashid. Of course, please know um, that all uh, uh, participants are welcome to get in contact with Rashid yeah. if they would like to do a one-on-one -on -one interview. So thank you very much, Rashid, thank for your you time. Thank you very much, Mona. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Enjoy okay. this. Let's get an agreement. Okay, please. Yes, yes. Yeah. We're counting on you. Thank you. Thank you, Rashid. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Okay, so we've got some excellent questions here. We've got two, I think, which would be good for Alice. So we have one from Alistair McCaster, McMaster, sorry. What kind of sustainability measures are the WTO proposing to accompany the continuation of harmful subsidies in least developed countries? Thank you, Mona, and thanks um, for the question as well. It's a, it's a really good one. You know, what's interesting, and I was just reaching for my copy of the text, uh, which is on the WTO's website, so you can see for yourself what the rules look like. So interestingly, the rules don't actually prescribe, they don't require a specific set of sustainability measures. It's actually very open at the moment. Uh, and this is one of the criticisms, in fact, of this exemption um, or this qualification, this sort of exemption from the prohibition. Uh, so at the moment, what it requires is that a member demonstrate that it has implemented measures to maintain stocks at a biologically sustainable level. 
And it doesn't say what measures you have to have. It just says you have to have implemented measures. So governments will be able to choose what measures they think are appropriate in the context of that fishery. Um, it does, there's a little footnote that explains that when you set your biologically sustainable level, you should use specific reference points that are common in fisheries management, uh, but it's, it's not prescriptive. So it doesn't list exactly what you have to do. It's still quite open. Um, which has the benefit, of course, that it is more flexible and that many governments might be able to use that exemption. Uh, but, and that, of course, is, is a benefit in some eyes and a problem in other eyes, because it means the exemption could actually be used by many governments in many different situations. That's the best answer I can give to that one at this point. I hope that's, that's great. No, that was very helpful, Alice. Okay. And while I've got you on the line, we have another very mm. good question from James Fan. James Fan is, of course, the executive director of the Earth Journalism Network. Mm -hmm. um, so James is asking, can anyone speak as to why the WTO negotiations and subsidies had to be extended until September, at least, um, when they were supposed to be finalized this month? What are the main holdups? and which are the main countries who are reluctant to cut their harmful subsidies. So I think Alice and, and Beatrice, perhaps you're both best placed to answer these questions. I don't know which one of you would like to go first. Well, if you like, I can perhaps sort of speak to the broader, yes. the broader process. Um, and yes, I mean, there is a meeting of, of WTO ministers tomorrow, uh, the 15th of July. Uh, and this meeting was originally billed, originally described as being uh, a meeting that would consider an almost final version of the text of the, of the agreement. Um, and I think the, the basic reality is that despite very hard work uh, and ambassadors have been working into the evenings, uh, they've been working on Saturdays here in Geneva, despite all of that hard work, they still haven't managed to get political mandates to close the final gaps and make the final compromises needed to finalize the text of the treaty. And I think at this point, the hope is that by bringing ministers together tomorrow, uh, and there'll be a large number of ministers speaking on this topic, that that will give the negotiators, the ambassadors and the delegates here, uh, sort of political impetus uh, and greater sort of greater priority and greater urgency that will, I think, then enable them to close the remaining gaps uh, that are still left in the treaty. So removing the last brackets in the text, for example. Um, so I think it, it hasn't been for lack of effort that the negotiations haven't closed. Uh, it seems like they just need a bit more time and I think a bit more political pressure from their ministers and also frankly, political pressure from outside the WTO system. So people like yourselves, telling your governments uh, that this is important and that they need to bring flexibility to the table to make sure the agreement is closed. Beatrice may be able to speak to some of the, the, the different politics because I know she's well aware of them as well. No, well, I, I think it comes down to uh, vested interest. Uh, if you have, you have some uh, organization, because an organization is a country like the EU, a group of country, uh, which have been allocating subsidies to their fleet for decades, particularly on access agreements, for example, and they don't really want, it's, it will not be easy to change that. So I think this, the EU is reluctant to do that, but there are equally some other countries which are reluctant to give up on subsidies. China, for example, is, is really uh, uh, booming. The presence of China is really important now all along the coast of Africa. And I think it would be very difficult for them if they have to stop subsidizing uh, the, their distant water fleet through reflagging access agreement, et cetera. So th it's difficult. But I, I think the, the important thing will be to see what the compromise will be. Because you, we can have a, a really good compromise on both sides which would be that the uh, subsidizing, <clears throat> sorry, subsidizing member will accept to diminish the subsidies, particularly on distant water fleets, while there will be the, the su sufficient flexibilities for developing state to support sustainable fisheries, particularly sustainable small scale fisheries. So that would be the ideal compromise, but we can have the reverse. We can have a compromise whereby the subsidizing states 
will be able to continue subsidizing and in exchange they will allow more flexibility even too much flexibilities going for developing states to develop for example their own industrial fleet which often will be importing uh, foreign vessels from china <clears throat> from korea from europe so that will really be for me the, the important thing where will the uh, where do we land what will be the compromise reach and whether that compromise will be really in favor of sustainable fisheries, particularly fishing communities in Africa or not. So that's, uh, yes, what is at stake. Hmm. Thank you very much, Beatrice. And while I have you on the line, we have a question here from Robert Mon Ojok. Um, how can the Ramsar protocol be a solution to fishing subsidies? Are you prepared <laughs> to answer that? Well, I'm not, a, I'm not a specialist of the Ramsar, but uh, I think what is, uh, maybe what I can say is that certainly the protection of coastal zones is very important for small scale fisheries. So if you can design properly and protect properly coastal areas, reserve it to small scale fisheries, that will go so a long way in addressing the, the problems they have with industrial fishing. So, it's, it's not a solution, but if you have on the one side uh, subsidies reined in for industrial fishing that fish off the coast of Africa, and I'm really particularly uh, thinking about coastal trawlers, because that's where the problem is for artisanal fishing, it's coastal trawlers. It's not, they have their own problem, but it's not the parasailers fishing for tuna uh, very far offshore. It is the coastal trawlers. So if on the one side, it's possible to find disciplines that train in the subsidies that are given to these coastal trawlers at the moment, through access agreement, through reflagging, fuel detaxation, you name it. And on the other side, have coastal areas which are really well-defined, well-protected, reserved for ourselves fishing, that will go a long way into ensuring a sustainable uh, environment for, for, for fisheries. Thank you very much, Beatrice, for taking that question. We have another question here from Samuel from Nairobi, Kenya. Perhaps, Wanjohi, you might want to answer that. The question is, I would like to understand how fish from Kenya finds its way to South Africa. Wanjohi, do you have any insight on this? Yes, uh, one is trafficking. And then the second one is, of course, uh, misrepresentation. When they are declaring the export permits, they make uh, references that are false claims. And that's how the fish is exported to South Africa. There is um, a gentleman at the chat who asked um, that some counties, uh, that's the Kenyan system of the local government, do not have access to illegal fisheries and that kind of thing. And I would say this in the Kenyan Fisheries Act, there is a provision of the minister at the time, currently they are called cabinet secretaries, to set up a bank to help fishermen, to help fishing communities financially. That is simple measures, is simply giving them subsidies. It has been there since the 1960s, but it has never been established. And the question is why? And the answer is as good as mine. So Alphonse, your question is answered. You find out why and it's there in the act why it has never been set up for fishermen. It's been there since 1960s to this day. It's in words, but it has never been in deed. I think I've answered the two questions. Thank you very much, Wanjohi. And, and while I have you on the line, we have a, a comment from Anne Mikia. Thanking you very much for your valuable presentation, saying that she's learned a lot, especially that one can go on a sabbatical and bounce back to the profession with vigor. Um, this gives hope that all is not lost. Um, so also we have Samuel from, from Kenya, I believe is also asking a question here. Um, in Mombasa County, local fishermen are spotting China vessels in Indian Ocean, which has greatly influenced their livelihoods that are drastic measures that should be taken to end such. Have you got any insights, Wanjohi, on any of the activities of these Chinese vessels off the coast of Mombasa? 
the locals call them illegal fisheries. They're not illegal, they've been registered. They are legal, they have the licenses. The question is, and that's where the good thing is coming, is that um, why? And also find out how much they are paying for a whole year, the license fee for a whole year, and how much uh, the cost of fish that they take, the tonnage, and you'll be surprised. They pay very little. The last I checked is that they pay uh, $50,000 for a whole year license, and then they fish for 24 hours. The 50,000 license dollar, they make it in two days fisheries. Please find out, that's a good story. It's a beautiful story. Find out how much they sell the fish for, how much tonnage they get. And you'll be surprised that you are into a very interesting story, but be careful. That needs a good investigation. It's an investigative story, but very beautiful story all the same. Go for it. And you have the experts here, I will tell you more. Uh, contact them to get the other bits of the story and then follow the money. You'll be surprised at what you find. But it's a good story, an award-winning story, I can assure you. Go for it. Thank you Anyone? very much. Uh, thank you very much, Wenjoyu. Uh, we actually, one journalist, Brian Cunha, was curious to know how many investigative pieces you had done in East Africa. I have lost count, but they uh, I've lost count. Uh, more than 30, more than 40, I've lost count. I've done many. And uh, most of them have won awards. So I really can't say how many. I, I, I would need to go to my files to check. Yeah. And that's a well, no, one, I, no, wonder you're, no wonder you're winning awards because you're the only one doing them. <laughs> you need more competition. I <laughs> people to join in. Come in. There is a lot to be done. Come in. Let's do this. The most interesting stories you will ever get are in fisheries. Please join in. Yeah. I and the good thing is that uh, um, Art Journalism Network is giving grants. Please take advantage of them. Please apply. Take your time. And uh, I've seen that the deadline is tomorrow. Do it tonight. Don't wait for tomorrow. These things never wait for tomorrow. You do with them on the spur of the moment. Get your things right. You've already had the lead. They are what locals consider them illegal. Why do locals consider them illegal? It's not that they are, they are, the locals are misinformed. They have some information. Then follow up the official sources. The official sources, uh, sources will tell you, oh, these are all legal. They paid the license fees. And that's when now you will start to unravel what goes on. So go for it. Thank you for those encouraging words. And yes, of course, we really do encourage you to, to apply for these grants. You'll be considered that particularly um, applicants from Africa are, are favorably considered in this process. So um, we don't have much time left. We have a question here from Joseph Johnson on Sierra Leone, um, which is coming increasingly under the spotlight. So the question is, and I thought perhaps Beatrice, you could tackle this. Um, where does Sierra Leone stand in terms of fishing stock in the Africa and the world? Yeah, well, I know a little bit of Sierra Leone because we have been following what the uh, EU vessels, Italian vessels, are doing in Sierra Leone. So there is no fishing agreement, but they just take direct authorization from the uh, Sierra Leone authorities. And what we saw was that they were... Uh, taking advantage of the uh, relative weakness of Sierra Leone to police its water to come and fish within the three mile zone, which is normally uh, a zone which is forbidden to, uh, to, to trawling. So I think that is an example, but we know that a lot of Chinese vessels are there as well, doing the same kind of thing, coming and fishing within the, uh, the three mile zone. Um, it's very difficult to know where the administration stands because on the one side, they, they say, well, we can't police the waters, but they keep giving authorization to fish to foreign vessels. So it's a bit of a, a contradiction in a way, because 
probably mm -hmm. these vessels, as, uh, as uh, you were saying, uh, are paying the license fee, but they are really depleting the resources of Sierra Leone. They are really uh, fishing for sharks. They, they, they are really uh, uh, doing illegal operations. And Sierra Leone doesn't have the capacity and doesn't have the political will also sometimes to act against that. So yes, it's, it's unfortunately it's a it's a it's a sad example, but that you find also in other other countries. I uh, think about Madagascar, for example, where the situation is very difficult for for fishing communities right now, and it's it's often because yes, they are legal, they have a license, but often it's uh, the, the government is giving too many licenses. So yes, they have a license, but it's it's it leads to unsustainable level of fishing. Even if they have a license, it's not sustainable. And even if they have a license, they sometimes come too close to the shore or they fish for species they shouldn't fish. So uh, illegality is, 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 uh, is more than just having a license, no? Uh, you, can, you can have a license and still be doing illegal fishing. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a complex issue. It's linked also to the lack of transparency in the maritime fisheries generally. So that's why also uh, fishing organizations, many of them in many countries, are asking for more transparency and particularly for the publication of licensed vessels, because that's really the, the, the starting point. If the, the licensed vessels are published, then people, particularly fishers, can have a look and say, we don't think this is sustainable. No, we don't think that giving, it was a case in Senegal last year, we don't think that giving 50 licenses to Chinese vessels to come and fish for small pelagics mm -hmm. in our waters is something sustainable. So I think transparency is really also very important to, uh, to ensure for subsidies, but generally for maritime fisheries. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Effectively, transparency is at the cornerstone of change and journalists have a very, very important role to uh, increase the level of transparency in fisheries. It's one of the most secretive closed doors uh, uh, negotiation processes, and especially during these times of COVID, there's even less access to some of these meetings. So the role of each and every one of you is very important to be able to continue that free flow of information uh, within the communities, in the media, but also hold people to account. We're now running up to the close of, the, of our webinar. We've had some fantastic questions. We have not been able to address all of them, but we've had some great comments here. Um, what I suggest that we do is that we will circulate um, an email to all the participants with a recording, as well as some of the contact details for our panelists. So if you're interested in, in, in contacting them or you know, on a one-to-one -one basis or doing an interview, they'll be able to do that. Um, and also we'll circulate the application for the Earth Journalism Grant for um, subsidies. So with that, I would really like to thank our panelists for their time. I think that the discussion was very, very interesting and thank also all the attendees for participating in all your great questions. So with that, thank you very much and, uh, and hopefully uh, speak again at some point in September when the WTO negotiations resume. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Mona. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.